I give you Dr. Rummel. <laughs> Dr. Rummel. We couldn't resist. So I thought I'd been asked to introduce the great chancellor because of the fact that I knew him and for a long time and maybe because he was my colleague down the street when he was at the medical center. But it turns out I think I got chosen so that William could show that uh, <laughs> Harlem video. Uh, uh, so uh, I am. Um, well, I'm very privileged to be with you all and, and, and welcome again to San Antonio. Uh, this is indeed a great city and it certainly uh, accepts uh, your interests as we're very interested in education in this city. Our speaker tonight, as you might have already assessed, is a remarkable individual. I've had the pleasure of knowing him for the last 13 years. He leads one of America's largest and best higher education system. Of course, he was known to you because he was the first Latino to head up a medical school, which he did extremely well in 2000 and 2009. As today, he is the only Latino uh, to head up a higher education system, which he's been headed since 2009. Uh, if you look at all the honors, that, uh, I think the, the highlights are the fact that he is a member of the American College of Surgery, the Institute of Medicine, the American Academy of Arts and Science, and then Mexico honored him with the National um, Arts and Science Award. Uh, we uh, also serve together on President Obama's uh, White House Commission on Higher Education Excellence, as does uh, Millie, uh, and proud to, be, uh, proud to be his colleague. Now, there are three things I'm going to say very briefly, and one of them I begin by noting uh, who he is. He defines himself, in, in not publicly, he doesn't shy away from it, no, on the uh, whole question of family. And, the, and that is that he defines himself as an individual um, very much formed by family and his roots in Laredo. Uh, he is one of 10 children, third generation physician. Uh, if I were to try to pick a few words uh, to describe him, I would say uh, caring, uh, compassionate, uh, kind. Um, the second part, and getting now that you know a little bit about him and, and, and what sort of makes him tick, is moving to the area of skills and competency. Um, the fact that he's always uh, strived to excel. Uh, he's, he is uh, an individual who went to um, early undergraduate uh, work at Yale, then on to Southwestern Medical School, which is one of the best, and he studied under Dr. Michael Brown, who won the Nobel Prize and, call, and, and called Dr. Sigaro the best student he'd ever seen in 30 years. Uh, from there on to, to Harvard, where he was at Mass General, and then on to uh, John Hopkins before coming over here to head up our medical center in, um, in San Antonio. Um, the training was great. He did 12 years of postgraduate training because it prepared him to do things that very few people had done uh, not only in this nation, but in the world. Uh, he is renowned as a, a pediatric uh, surgeon. Uh, he made medical history when a team that he worked with split a donor's liver for a transplant, one to an adult, part of it to an adult, and the other, one, the other part to a five-month baby. You can imagine just, make, just the transplant liver part is extremely complex and then to actually give it to two donors uh, was uh, really uh, medical history, certainly in Texas. Um, as I noted, he heads uh, a gigantic institution, uh, 15 universities, nine academics, six medical schools, with 11.9 11, uh, 11 billion dollar budget. Uh, I have been to many meetings with him because we, we, we meet very often and I've uh, seen uh, the leadership uh, qualities that he has, and that's the third point I'm going to make about his leadership. Uh, he is known as a man of vision uh, and innovation, and, but really keen on implementation. And you can see why, if you're a surgeon, you want to start the job and finish the job. Uh, if you're a surgeon, you pay attention to accountability. 
and he does. Uh, the system had never had anyone lay out uh, where we're going, what we're going to do, and Clark Kerr was mentioned, and uh, Dr. Sigurdova laid out for us the nine frameworks and the nine strategies for the frameworks, and it includes, of course, number one, success for un undergraduate students, number two, recruiting great faculty and keeping administrators and staff uh, happy and recruiting them as well. Uh, number three, dealing with expansion of research and uh, also PhD programs. And the, f the last one, there were nine, I'm just giving you a kind of sort of sample of them. The last one, when he talked about it uh, some three years ago, I wondered where it was gonna go. And he said, we, we, are, we need to commit to the health of Texas. What would that mean? Well, it's probably it's gonna be his greatest legacy. He's done so many things. As a result of his work, we will have a new medical school in Austin, Texas. It's going to happen. Michael Dell has already given $50 million to, start, to kick it off. But also, more importantly, one of the poorest areas of America, South Texas, will get a medical school. And this has been a long undertaking, but under his leadership, it finally kind of worked it together. And by the way, it's not like he doesn't have other things to do. Uh, as you know, there's a, in Brownsville, Texas, they're going to move from one part, maybe move to another part. Uh, Pan American, they're going to merge and talk. Uh, they're going to be these two schools and medical school. It's just really remarkable what's going on. Um, but I, I, can't, I can't say enough about my colleague. Uh, fortunately, um, the one thing he has, he tells anyone he works with him, this is my cell number, and I'm available 24-7. And he means it. I have gotten... I have gotten emails uh, from him at midnight and five in the morning. I've gotten calls from him very late as well. He works all the time. He, is, uh, he's, he really is a, a, a talented, but he's not a workaholic. He enjoys life. He, he, he is known, very well known for being an accomplished guitarist. He plays classical guitar. His wife, Graciela, is a, a good friend of ours, and she's an attorney in, in Austin. She's from No Laredo, Texas, No Laredo, Mexico. Uh, they have a daughter. Uh, that we gotten to know, Christina, uh, who went to Harvard and then UT Law and at the, doing an M uh, MA degree in uh, LBJ and now aspires to be a professor of sociology one day. The other bar, and Barbara, is Barbara at Harvard as well? Or Yale? Yale? So the, the daughter went to Yale like that. So this is a very accomplished individual and, will, and it takes great pride in the fact that he is, from his perspective, he is surrounded by giants. And the giants are the family that raised him. Let's give a big hand to Dr. Sigaroa. Well, isn't Ricardo Romo incredible? I'd have to say one of the most important uh, jobs of a chancellor of the Board of Regents is selecting great presidents. And in Ricardo Roma, we have one of the greatest presidents of higher education in America. And he did test the issue of whether I answer my cell phone or not, because about 10 minutes ago, he called me and goes, where are you? <laughs> I go, I'm at the Hyatt, the Grand Hyatt. He goes, you're at the wrong Hyatt. <laughs> I said, Ricardo, I'm about two minutes away. Well, a few years ago, uh, Ricardo and I were, were presidents of, of the two University of Texas system institutions in San Antonio. The University of Texas San Antonio and the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio. And um, it was really a wonderful journey for me. Uh, first, I remember going to Ricardo Romo's office uh, before I became president of the Health Science Center. I knew I was going to be interviewed by the Board of Regents, and I asked Ricardo, what do you do? <laughs> you be prepared, be yourself, and, and lay out a vision. Uh, but the other aspects is that Ricardo and I uh, were really two of the first presidents in the UT system who pledged to each other that we were going to collaborate and we were going to focus our attention on student success, but also to bring in more federal research dollars and more innovation to San Antonio, Texas. 
And as a result of that, we created the San Antonio Life Science Institute, uh, otherwise known as Salsi, but in this crowd, we're going to call it Salsa. <laughs> uh, but that wouldn't have happened without Ricardo. Now, it really is a leading example of how UT universities, both academic and health, can collaborate with each other. I also want to thank President Luis Olivas and the American Association of Hispanics in Higher Education for, invite, for inviting me to uh, deliver the 2013 Tomas Rivera Lecture. What an honor. I'm again honored to address this distinguished audience of academic leaders in higher education, especially in this city and in homage to my fellow Texan, the great writer, the remarkable scholar, and the profound academic leader, Tomas Rivera. Again, welcome to San Antonio. I also know that Ricardo will agree with me when I say that San Antonio is a very special place. It's a place not only in Texas history, but also for family as well. There's a word in Spanish that describes it perfectly well, and that is gerencia. It's a place of the heart. It's where one feels serene and from which one draws strength. And that is what San Antonio means to our family. And this is a great city to raise your children, for them to be biculturally competent, to educate your family, to pursue a higher education like at University of Texas San Antonio, and also to seek employment. I want to personally congratulate before this uh, distinguished group, uh, Mayor Julian Castro and the citizens of San Antonio for their vision to advance excellence in our public education system. They're doing a remarkable job in really better preparing our children to be college ready. Well, my Cigarroa grandparents fled the Mexican Revolution and they settled here in San Antonio where they raised my father and his siblings. During the Great Depression, my grandfather, Dr. Joaquin Cigarroa, who received his medical degree at UNAM in Ciudad de Mexico, had a very, very uh, wonderful clinic. But then the Great Depression hit and he opened up, he was really the first individual to open up a clinic, uh, a free clinic for those who could not pay. Well, he didn't realize that his paying patients realized that they could see the same doctor in the free clinic. And that's when I realized you really needed to have a good financial performer uh, because really financially it didn't go so well for him. And the only way he can get out of it with honor was actually to move to Laredo, Texas. And so that's how the Cigarroas ended up in Laredo uh, because his business planning didn't really work so well. Um, anyhow, my father is, is also a physician and he is still practicing in Laredo at the age of 88. <laughs> he remains the smartest individual that I know. Um, he always calls me to say that his patients went either to Southwestern or to Health Science Center San Antonio. They couldn't figure it out. They finally went back to him in Laredo and he made the diagnosis a week later. <laughs> I get a phone call at least once a month, mijito, let me tell you what happened. <laughs> but he still comes home you know, with a smile every day and he conveyed to his children how important education is, what his experience was like at the University of Texas and how wonderful it is to take care of patients. It was that, and it continues to be, that positive attitude, that installation of confidence in your children that resulted in all his 10 children receiving a higher education degree. We also didn't want to disappoint mothers. She was pretty strict. <laughs> well, Tomas Rivera's circumstances were different than mine. He was from Crystal City, about 90 miles north of Laredo the son of migrant workers who became a migrant worker himself. Traveling from Texas throughout the Midwest with his family, working in the fields of Michigan and Minnesota, and even as chancellor of the University of California at Riverside, he never forgot the experiences of his migrant life. He wrote an epic poem entitled, The Searchers, in which he compared the migrant experience to a search for identity, for a voice and a place of, of one's own. He wrote, and let me paraphrase, 
We were not alone in Iowa when we slept in wet ditches, frightened by salamanders at night reclaiming their territory. We were not alone when we walked all over Minnesota looking for work. No one seemed to care, and we did not expect them to care. From within came the passage to create of every clod and stone, a new life, a new dream. Each day in these very things we searched as we crumbled dust. Well, everyone here this evening understands what Tomas Rivera is saying in his poem. In spite of adversity, we have a dream that provides a better future for our children and our grandchildren. Fundamentally, that is what we want. You and I are privileged to be educators, and with that, we're important role models. And we believe that education is the key to a stronger, more prosperous, and more meaningful life. No one can take your education away. But we're also living in a new era and facing profound changes that are impacting our search or for a better future. The primary question then is how will we adapt and how will we move forward? For one thing, there is a major shift taking place in the demographics of our country and this is having a profound effect on K through 12 and higher education. According to the 2010 census between the years 2000 and 2010, 50 million Americans identified themselves as Hispanic an increase of 43% over the previous decade. States along the border, like Texas, are experiencing this sea change at a more rapid pace. There are 10 million Hispanics in Texas, and the vast majority of them being of Mexican descent. Now, what is happening in Texas and other border states is what the rest of the nation will experience over the next decade. So in Texas, the future is already here. In fact, it's been here for some time. And so it is instructive to examine trends in Texas to get a better sense of things to come. The rapid growth of the Hispanic population in Texas is having a major impact on our economy, our education system, our healthcare system, and in almost every facet of public life. More than 38% of Texas population is now Hispanic, versus 16.7% in the rest of the country. Hispanics are projected to become the largest ethnic group two years from now, by the year 2015. This increase in population is most notably present in young Hispanics. 27% of the Texas population is under 18, and almost 50% of that population is Hispanic. That is a very important figure for us to imprint. 47% of our K through 12 student population in Texas is Hispanic. And the median age for Hispanics in Texas is 27, but for whites, it is 41 uh, years of age. The Texas of 2020 is going to look a lot different than the Texas of today, I can promise you that. And so it is clear to me that we must nurture the talents and the aspirations of our young Hispanic students who will soon become our leaders in governance, our leaders in public service, in education, in healthcare, and numerous other fields, not only in Texas, but across the nation. Young Latinos stand on the strong foundation built by the courageous men like Tomas Rivera and women who work for generations to advance the cause of equal opportunity and equal participation. We have our parents, we have our abuelitos, we have our abuelitas, and earlier generations to thank for their sacrifices and their perseverance. We are now poised at a threshold of realizing their dreams, a dream shared by Tomas Rivera and Martin Luther King. And you and I share the responsibility to usher this new era in a way that makes all Americans, in fact, the entire world, grateful for their arrival. But our challenges are certainly not all behind us. Our challenges are real and they are present. When it comes to Hispanic education, the key to a better life that everyone here believes in is these are some troubling times for our young Hispanic population. For example, 34% of Texas Hispanics under the age of 18 live in poverty. Hispanics are less likely to graduate from high schools 
compared to whites. 61% of Hispanics who were seventh graders in 2000 graduated from a Texas high school compared with 74% of other students. Attrition rates are about 37% for Hispanic high school students in Texas. That's unacceptable. In the cohort between ages 25 and 64, only 14% of native-born Texas Hispanic students have college degrees. 23% of native-born Texas Hispanics ages 25 to 64 are high school dropouts. In other words, among Hispanic Texans, there are more high school dropouts than there are college graduates. Well, let me point out here that these disparities do not exist solely among Hispanics in Texas. Since the 1970s, and this is an important point I want to make, the disparity in educational attainment across the United States between students in the lowest and highest family income quartiles, that is, comparing the lowest socioeconomic quartile compared to the highest, that inequity or that disparity has widened. In the 1970s, only 7% of those in the lowest quartile and 37% in the highest quartile completed baccalaureate degrees. By the first decade of the 21st century, the percentage of those in the lowest quartile of family income who completed baccalaureate degrees had increased only slightly to 9%, while the percentage of those in the highest quartile had nearly doubled to 70%. That is, in my opinion, an astonishing and unacceptable disparity. It is our responsibility as leaders in higher education, especially those of us who serve the lowest quartile of family income, to close that gap. Now, we're very, very proud to have our flagships, our universities within the AAU. But I'm also particularly proud that we are investing in our emerging research universities that, through their mission and through their demographics, have been serving many of these students who come from the lower socioeconomic quartile. And so what Ricardo Romo is doing, what Diana Natalicio, what others are doing within the University of Texas who have been traditionally serving students who are at risk are going to make the most incredible advances uh, in the United States of America. And so again, we also, we always talk about our flagships, but let us not forget our universities like UTSA who are really changing the opportunities for millions of students across this nation. Although these statistics are discouraging, I would be misleading if I gave you the impression that no progress had been made in Texas over the past decade. The University of Texas system, for example, has made a concentrated effort to increase Hispanic enrollment in our institutions. This has been a group endeavor involving the UT system leadership, our Board of Regents, our legislature and other policymakers, and of course, the presidents of the UT system's 15 institutions, their faculty and their staff. We've worked extremely hard to have our successful efforts not to be overlooked and not to be unnoticed. So let me convey to you, I've, I've conveyed to you the challenges. Let me convey to you the progress that has been made at UT system. Nearly 40% of all UT students now are Hispanic, 40% and growing. Those percentages are significantly higher at our three universities in South Texas. UTSA is at 45%, UT Pan Am is at 90%, UT Brownsville is at 90%, and UTEP is at 78%. And even in the Permian Basin, in North Texas, it's at 42%. <coughs> UT system now has a majority, minority student population. Imagine that. Enrollment, from 2000 to fall of 2012, there has been a 73% increase in Hispanic enrollment at UT academic institutions and a 60% increase in Hispanic enrollment at UT health institutions. From 2000 to 2012, there has been a 112% increase in degrees awarded to Hispanics at our academic institutions and a 100% increase in degrees awarded to Hispanics at our health institutions, which includes physicians and it includes dentists and pharmacists. Half of all degrees earned by Hispanics in public 
four-year universities in this great state of Texas are awarded by our UT system universities. But in spite of this progress, because I will never rest, uh, no matter how much progress we're making, Hispanic graduation rates are low at our universities and must be addressed. At UT Austin, for example, only 43% of our Hispanic students graduate in four years, which is about 10% lower than other ethnic groups. The six-year graduation rate, of course, is much better with Hispanics graduating at nearly 77%, but we are concerned, I am personally concerned, about the financial burden on Hispanic families who must provide two additional years of tuition and other expenses. Over the past year, of which uh, the provost of UTSA uh, was part of this task force, we began a student debt reduction task force, and it has made several recommendations that will lower the financial burden of a college education, <clears throat> including more work study and internship opportunities, competency-based learning credits, accelerated online learning, and rebates and tuition relief for students who graduate in four years. In fact, this year, Ricardo Romo lowered tuition. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Collectively, we must do everything we can to ensure the Hispanic students and all students, every student, that they are not saddled with massive loan debt that restricts their choices at the beginning of what should be a successful and a fulfilling life. It also behooves us to work with our K through 12 schools, our community colleges, to make certain that when our students arrive on our higher education campuses, that they are college ready. All of you have learned about student debt. We know that student debt exceeds the credit card loan debt, almost exceeds auto loan debt. And there's about a 20% default rate. That's a lot of money in America. But when you take a look at those who default, 80% of those students do not graduate. And so if we can improve graduation rates, we can actually eliminate 80% of the default rates. I'm convinced about that. So I do believe that we are on the right track at the University of Texas institutions and we are moving in the right direction. We are making progress. We are increasing educational opportunities, not only for Hispanics, but for all our citizens in this great state. Over the past two years, Texas has been deeply involved in the national discussion on the future of higher education in America. And if you read the Chronicle of Higher Education or Inside Higher Ed, you know that the discussion is still lively and it's ongoing in Austin. I think we may be a little bit louder at the moment, but after all, it's Texas, and we're grappling with the same issues that you are grappling within your own institutions. Well, how do we make a college education more accessible and more affordable for middle class and low income families? How do we improve the learning environment on our campuses? How do we use technology to strengthen the classroom experience? How do we adapt to our state's rapidly changing demographics, produce more college graduates, and prepare them for successful careers? Well, Ricardo alluded to this, but we developed a new initiative called a Framework for Advancing Excellence throughout the University of Texas system which was adopted unanimously by our Board of Regents in 2011 and endorsed by all 15 presidents. The framework includes an action plan that is bringing a higher level of accountability, a higher level of transparency to our university and health institutions. Any one of you can go to our website, click on to the dashboard, and understand how we are progressing on the goals that we have set forth on. For our purposes here, I will emphasize how this plan will help us to be more responsive to the needs of Hispanic students and their families. Let me begin with our framework focus on expanding educational and health opportunities in South Texas and the Rio Grande Valley. We have a very comprehensive outline on this, but let me just state that this is an area with a 90% Hispanic population and where the vast majority of our students, again, are Hispanic. As a native son of the Texas-Mexico border region, I saw how geography became destiny for many of our schoolmates, our neighborhood friends, and even family members. There's one time in my life 
that I have never forgotten. I think it has made me a better chancellor. I never forgot a very dear friend of mine by the name of Bethel, who was with me in high school and who graduated in the top 5%. In fact, he had a higher GPA than I did. And I remember we were, of course, a bit competitive, and I remember asking Pedro, Oye, Pedro, where are you going to college? And he said, well, you know, Francisco, I cannot go to college because of expenses and the fact that Laredo does not have a four-year university. It's not even close by. San Antonio, didn't even, UTSA didn't even exist in those times. Well, I suspect that many of you have had friends in that same situation. And for the average person near the border, the opportunities for upward mobility can at times be limited. So consider these facts. The median household income in the Valley is about $25,000 a year, while for Texas, it exceeds 50,000. In the Valley, 40% of families with children live below the poverty line as compared to 17% in Texas and 14% nationwide. The Valley has 107 physicians per 100,000 compared to the average in America of 220 physicians per 100,000. And if you take a look at the state of Texas, it's 200. So now you're getting the picture that even from a health perspective, the Valley is underserved. The Valley population is growing also at a remarkable pace. According to, to the uh, data center, the current population is about 1.3 million, and by 2018, it will be 1.6 million. This means that there is a growing need for doctors and health professionals, teachers, and a myriad of other professionals that will improve basic services, educate our children, and grow the economy of the state and our nation. Well, the UT Board of Regents authorized $30 million to implement the framework plan for South Texas, but let me tell you how that started. So Ricardo told me, conveyed to you that when I first became chancellor, I very much realized that you've got to set goals. And you've got to set those goals very quickly. Otherwise, when you lead an organization as large as UT system, six years can pass by and you've done nada. One of those goals was to actually plant a larger flag in South Texas where the population is 90% Hispanic. I was able to get two or three regions at our first retreat to say, we need to plant a larger flag in South Texas. And then I never let that momentum stop. So within the first year, I got the Board of Regents to allocate $30 million uh, to really help establish a faculty recruitment program to attract exceptional faculty members in the STEM disciplines, and also to help recruit biomedical researchers to our universities and our health institutions in that region. In addition, I felt very strongly that we needed to increase math and science teacher training in South Texas by using UT Austin's nationally acclaimed UTeach program. At the end of the day, we as universities also have a responsibility to educate the very best teachers for K through 12, treat them like professionals, in fact, treat them like heroes. I will add here that President Obama has praised UTeach as a model for teacher training, and last week the White House announced that a major gift from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute would be used to extend the UTeach program to top to 10 top research universities over the next five years. An article in the Scientific American has noted that UTeach has grown rapidly from a presence on 20 campuses in 2010 to 35 today. And the Howard Hughes Medical Institute funding will allow it to reach 45 schools, training an additional 2,000 STEM teachers for a total of 17,000 in this nation. Well, this is why UT Austin is fond of saying, <coughs> what starts here changes the world. Well, the centerpiece of UT Systems South Texas plan is the consolidation of UT Pan Am, UT Brownsville into a single comprehensive university with a new school of medicine and the promise of becoming a research intensive university similar to UTSA, UTEP, UT Dallas, and UT Arlington. When we do this, and I may add that the we, we need to get legislative authority for this, and yeah, that'd be great. And if you can believe it, the Senate passed this bill out of the Senate chamber three weeks ago, 31 yeas, one no. 
and a week later, the House chamber passed it 149 yay, zero nays. This will also, when, when we accomplish this, this, this consolidation and this implementation and the creation of a new school of medicine which addresses the healthcare needs of South Texas, we will also create the second largest Hispanic serving institute in the United States of America. That will happen within the next two years. There has also long been a recognized need. So, so let, me, let me just try to convey to you this, this framework. So when I was president of the Health Science Center here in San Antonio and Ricardo, we'd go up to Austin to the Board of Regents and we'd all sit down and we'd listen to our regents, you know, advanced excellence at, at University of Texas. And they started this incredible program called STARS funding. And STARS funding is precious revenue that we get from the West Texas lands where we have a oil, you know, huge oil and gas reserve that those revenues generate an endowment that's now worth $13 billion. And out of the distribution of those funds, the regions can provide funding to our campuses to recruit great faculty and to build wonderful facilities. Well, every time they would allocate funds, Julieta Garcia would raise her hand and say, for the record, UT Brownsville does not receive permanent university funds, otherwise known as POP. And then a nanosecond later, at that time, it was Miguel Nevarez would also raise his hand and say, for the record, UT Pan American doesn't receive these funds. And so here we have two universities that belong to the University of Texas system, and the only two universities that do not receive pop eligible funds are in a region that's 90% Hispanic. And so Julieta would say, you're telling us that we're part of the University of Texas, and you're telling us to compete with the other 13 universities. We have flip-flops, everybody else has Nikes. And so she said, Francisco, I expect you to do something about it. Well, I never, never forgot that statement. And when we faced this, this unbelievable challenge of unwinding a 20-year partnership between UT Brownsville and Texas Southmost College because the community college trustees wanted to have their own independent community college, trustees changed, politics changed, and you know, before I know it, a 20-year partnership in Brownsville, Texas is unwinding before my eyes. I remember just saying, I can't believe this is happening. The first Hispanic chancellor of the University of Texas system and a divorce is taking place on my watch. And the problem is that the community college, you know, 20, 30 years ago, everything was a handshake. And so suddenly we start taking a look at agreements as we're unwinding this partnership. The community college owns 90% of the buildings, most of the land, and I've got 13,000 students without a campus. I said, oh my God. And then I would see all these dreams come up because you know, the region said, of course we're gonna support you, we're gonna build a you know, new university in the 21st century. And you know, you'd see everybody's eyes glitter. But I, the realist, the surgeon would say, you know, it sounds great. But you know, my experience says you need a budget and I haven't yet seen a budget and I don't see where the resources are coming from. And if you think that all these problems are gonna be solved by the legislature, let me remind you what's happened over the past 16 years. Well, I was swimming one day, thinking about this, I mean, sleeping and waking up, thinking about all this, and suddenly I realized the only way we can, we can solve this problem is through permanent university funds. And so then I pitched this story out, and every time everybody would say, it's not possible. It's constitutionally not allowable. And so then I thought, well, you know, how about if we develop a new university? And how about if we bring these campuses together? And by the way, while I'm on a roll, why don't we build a medical school? Remember, I told you that three years ago. And, and then I looked at the constitutional lawyers and said, you know, is this within the constitutional? I mean, can we do this? He goes, now that. Nobody's ever thought about that, but, but creating a new university would make it eligible for POP. 
And if you're asking why these campuses weren't eligible 30, 40 years ago, is that we acquired them as community colleges. But new universities are eligible for pub. I think I can solve that. I'm chancellor of the University of Texas system. And so, for the very first time in over 100 years, these two universities will now, you know, I mean, we still have to get this past the legislature, but things look promising right now, will now be eligible to receive PUF funding and feel like an equal, like every other campus. And I figured, well, now that I'm on a roll, why not ask for $100 million? <laughs> so I asked the Board of Regents, you know, this is really a good plan. And we really need to catalyze the Regional Academic Health Center to become its independent school of medicine. And I think I'm going to need $100 million. And so now I had the regions feeling really good, really positive, and they said, of course. So in addition to this, we're sending $100 million down to South Texas. And let me also add a little more frosting to the cake. In his State of the State Address, Governor Rick Perry endorsed the University of South Texas, and as I've stated, the House and the Senate have been unanimous. Well, I am really proud to plant a larger University of Texas flag in the Rio Grande Valley like we promised at that very first retreat. I remember Julieta at that retreat started to cry, and she, the chairman of the board said, why are you crying? She goes, this is the first time that UT Brownsville has even been on the agenda on a Board of Regents retreat. I also have personal reasons for wanting to see more educational opportunities and better health care for the people in this region. When I was a kid, my father provided me with a tremendous experience in understanding the challenges faced by a medically underserved region along the Texas-Mexico border. It was, and it still is, a region with significant health care disparities, many of which are now looming public health issues, not only for Texas, but for this nation. In shadowing my dad, as he made house calls, of which he still is making house calls at the age of 88. In fact, I've got to tell you the story. About five years ago, he got kidnapped. He was at a railroad track, two cars came by, and you know, they wanted to take his car. And, and so, you know, dad didn't know what was happening, and so you know, they put him on the passenger side. And he was wearing a white coat. And so, you know, this gentleman goes, you know, are you a nurse? I mean, are you, you know, what do you do? He goes, well, no, you know, I, you know I'm Dr. Cigarroa. And then that guy gets on the sofa, he goes, this is Dr. Cigarroa, he saved my mother. <laughs> <laughs> and the other guy said, you know, my kid goes to the high school named after him. They said, they actually drove him back to the house. <laughs> It's a, you know, you can't make this up. I, you really can't make it up. But anyhow, well, it did, it did teach me to treat everybody with great respect. In shattering my father as he made house calls and seeing his love for his practice, I really received a firsthand view, not only of the beautiful art of medicine, but how this art profoundly touches all classes, from the poorest to the wealthiest without regard to economic status or homeland of origin. Because of that, I still take surgical call every third weekend. Dad came home with a smile on his face every evening after work, which is why his children have chosen medicine as their profession. Well, not long ago, I asked my father if he had fulfilled everything he wanted to do as a cardiologist. I mean, here is a man who's been practicing since 1950. He said, Francisco, the only thing that I regret is that I've never had the opportunity to train young medical students and share his expertise with them because there is no medical school in South Texas or the border region. He also advised me, Francisco, you've got the ability and you are in a position to build that medical school in the valley. And Francisco, maybe someday we don't have to keep sending our kids to Harvard and to Yale. Well, I know that this audience more than any other understands why this is personal to me. I am going to help build a medical school in the Valley out of respect, not only for my father and my uncle and my grandfather who are physicians, but also for the scores of physicians practicing along the border 
and in South Texas and the Valley who have waited their entire lifetimes to see young doctors study and train there, where their hometowns are, where their families are, and where they can remain and they can practice the beautiful art of medicine in their querencia, in their own city, in service to the people that they love in a bicultural and competent way. Well, as I've stated, I want to combine our universities in the Valley for the same reason. So they and these students can enjoy the benefits of a world-class education in the place where they want to raise their families and contribute something, something very special to their hometowns. Well, I am an eternal optimist. People have said, you know, you can put Francisco Cigarro six feet under, and he's gonna say, you know, it's a little cooler down here than it is above there. <laughs> I am an eternal optimist, and I think that's probably one of the reasons why uh, I've had the opportunities that have been given to me, because I never give up. I am pleased that Tomas Rivera ended his poem, The Searchers, on an uplifting note, as I have right now. He wrote that the destination of the migrant search comes from within, from an inner strength, but also from what we do together. So let me paraphrase Tomas Rivera again, because I feel him in this room. He wrote, from within came the passions to create of every clod and stone, a new life, a new dream, each day in these very things. We searched as we crumbled dust. We were not alone. After many centuries, how could we be alone? We searched together, we were seekers, we were searchers, and we will continue to search because our eyes still have the passion of prophecy. Well, as Tomas Rivera observed, we are seekers, we are searchers, and that search is a lifelong journey. We by no means are there yet. There is still a journey to be embarked upon, but we are many steps closer. All of our lives, you and I have been making this journey side by side, lado a lado, mano a mano. Each new step is harder, each challenge could be a little bit greater, but we search together, all of us as a familia, seeking to educate our children and our grandchildren to create a new and a better life and to fulfill the dreams of our parents, our abuelitos, and our abuelitas. I cannot imagine better friends and colleagues to make this journey with than you, the Hispanic leaders in higher education who are here in San Antonio this evening. All of you inspire me, you lift me, and we collectively have the greatest job in America, the stewards of education for the next generation. Well, let our journey continue together and thank you again for inviting me to share my thoughts with you. I am really incredibly honored to deliver this year's Tomas Rivera Lecture. Thank you very much.